Welcome back. I hope everybody had a uh, filling uh, lunch. Um, and I know sometimes after lunch, uh, the blood can pool in the <laughs> stomach, and which makes the eyes droop. <laughs> And to prevent that from happening, we uh, tried to organize what we thought were three uh, really important um, panels that focus on different types of libraries and to have leaders in each one of these fields talk amongst themselves, but then, of course, to make sure that the audience is an integral part of this conversation as well, because we all bring our different perspectives and experience, experiences to bear on the questions that they're going to be confronting. And to organize these panels, uh, we invited moderators to facilitate the discussions. And one of the things we tried to do is to have many of the uh, people on the panels, but especially the moderators, to have a, a range of their own experience that crosses a, across these kind of artificial barriers that we constructed in the program. So the first one's on public libraries, the second one's on academic and university libraries, and the third one's on independent research libraries. And so we created these distinctions, we created these uh, uh, categories and separations, but we really hope that this conversation uh, over this afternoon can cross across these barriers and we think the moderators will be, uh, uh, their experience will be very helpful in, in helping us to do that. And to moderate, the first one, uh, we invited Derek Dreyer, who served on the program committee for this uh, program. And Derek um, has a, a, a very fascinating career. Um, he was and is the director of the Rosenbach Library, but he's also the vice president of special collections for the Free Library. And what his official biography that I have here doesn't say is that um, Derek was really an innovator in terms of uh, addressing problems that his uh, independent research library faced years ago by constructing a creative, collaborative partnership with the Free Library, a public library, and that has borne fruit in a variety of ways. It's a thriving relationship and partnership, and his perspective as somebody that has been a director of an independent research library, and now not only that, but the vice president of special collections at a public library, we think is particularly helpful for this conversation. Um, in addition to his positions, Derek is also a scholar. He has a BA from Princeton and an MA and PhD from Yale in art history dating from the Renaissance. Derek? Um, why don't you guys go up? Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I think we're at a perfect point in this conference to turn the lens to public libraries. Um, Bob Hauser was good to remind us this morning that the seal that you see on the other side of this dais has that Latin phrase, nullo discrimine, which he said basically translates to open to all. And I thought he was refreshingly honest to tell us that that really meant all ideas for a very long time, and later, all people. Um, so it's been a fascinating 24 hours or so. Yesterday, a few people referred to public libraries or sometimes to public visitation to private libraries or to private libraries that were being thrust a little bit more into the public eye, and then in the evening, we had a star-studded panel. They kept referring to themselves as Martians, and <laughs> they shared a lot of uh, sometimes uncomfortable ideas with us, um, as well as some tantalizing prospects, such as collaborations between research libraries and public libraries. Um, but I couldn't help think to myself, you know, they, they refer to themselves as Martians, but today's panelists will truly seem to you like they are from deep outer space <laughs> because they are public librarians. They all have an MLS degree. I'll tell you a little bit about them in a moment. They circulate books. They host researchers like many of you. They have special collections typically. But these librarians also circulate neckties and check out musical instruments. They teach cooking and through it literacy and numeracy. They help the homeless stay warm and dry or connect with social workers. They aid workforce development, sometimes teaching English along the way, and they provide the internet access to boot. They keep kids in productive, safe settings after school. They administer naloxone when there's an opioid overdose in the bathroom. 
They connect, energize, and empower communities. And this is where I think we pick up on some of this morning's really interesting conversations. They provide outreach to prisons. And like most of you, they do all of this with budgets that are just never quite enough. So yes, today's panelists are from deep outer space. They're public librarians. We've selected these three partly because I think they're among the three smartest people on the planet, but partly because they also represent public libraries of very different sizes and in different regions. So I'm gonna introduce them briefly. Um, I was grateful that Patrick shortened the bio that I had provided and without asking my panelists, I've decided to abbreviate their bios too because I think you wanna hear from them more than about them, but allow me to give you brief introductions about each of the three. Uh, to your far left, Siobhan Reardon is president and director of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Through her leadership, the reimagining of the Free Library of the Future is highlighted with the library's <coughs> Building Inspiration campaign, marking the physical and programmatic changes necessary to present a viable 21st century library organization. Some of the notable enhancements include the establishment of the Culinary Literacy Center, the Center for Public Life, which is all about public and civic engagement, and, not least, an affiliation with the Rosenbach five years ago. The Free Library has well over 1,000 employees, 61 locations throughout Philadelphia, and over 6 million in-person visits each year. I'm not going to get into the web use and other off-site programs. Gina Millsap in the center is the Chief Executive Officer of the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. She leads an organization of 200 employees. It's a community of about 180,000, and Gina hosts about one million visits per year inside one library. It's not a network of neighborhood libraries, but there's vast outreach throughout the county. Uh, Gina has worked in libraries for 40 years, and while she describes that as antique, she also notes that her outlook is not. She is past president of ALA's Library Leadership and Management Association. She writes on a number of topics, and I know from experience she is uh, a great speaker and has lots of ideas about strategic planning in particular. Sue Considine, to my immediate left, is a speaker, independent consultant, and uh, for about 20 years, executive director of the Fayetteville Free Library outside Syracuse, which she just retired from this summer. As an administrator of a unique progressive public library, Sue successfully recruited and developed a team of dynamic professionals, staff, and community members to offer cutting edge library services in a state of the art environment to an engaged community. The community is about 10,000 people. The visitation is about 1,600 people per month. So you can see we're covering various different regions and sizes. And with that, let's stop talking about them and hear from them. Um, so I will sit now. Look at that, the microphone still works when I move around. <laughs> You, you, you heard that I studied art history and the only practical skill I learned was running a slide projector and those don't really <laughs> exist anymore. So um, I'm always amazed when I can do things. Um, we've heard a lot over the past 24 hours about librarians and how librarians are changing but need to change more. I, I think it was Khalil Muhammad who said last night we haven't changed what we teach mm -hmm. or how we educate librarians. Mm -hmm. And yet we can all embrace the notion that library, libraries will only thrive if librarians evolve and change. So what do we need to be teaching librarians today and in the future? Gina, can I kick that one to you first? Well, I, I have no opinions about this, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> neither and, of us and, do. and my degree oh, is in panel's it. over. Any questions? <laughs> um, I think to just kick this off, I think the best investment that we've made at my library in the last decade was to train 40 of our staff members to be facilitators. And why did we do that? Um, first of all, it's the key. How do we run our organizations? We run on meetings, right? So meetings can either be an interruption of work or they can be where you do your best work. 
And so we felt that it was important to train librarians and library staff to know how to work with their colleagues to get the best ideas implemented, first to put forward and implemented. It also has greatly influenced how we position the library in the community so that we are frequently called on to facilitate for community groups on topics ranging from poverty to community health to uh, community-based broadband planning. Um, so uh, if I were to look at, and I do look at curriculum for uh, curricula for uh, graduate library schools, um, some of them resemble the curriculum that I participated in, and as my degree is an antique. I mean, I got my degree in 1977 from the University of Missouri. And some of it has changed. Some of it is, is very forward thinking, but I, I think that what I'm looking for in terms of people I want to hire is, have you prepared this person to be a community leader? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I completely agree. Um, one of the things that um, concerns me as we bring in staff, um, new librarians as they come into the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, <clears throat> I have to say probably within one year, that new librarian is probably an acting supervisor within a year. And so the library school work has not trained that individual in human resources, in financial management, in building management, in what I'll refer to as social anthropology. It's the understanding the community you're serving um, because way too many times you'll, we'll start interviewing librarians and they'll say, well, I really love books. And if that, though, my God, the minute I hear that, I'm like, ah, no way. Because <laughs> it is not about the book in our world. It is about that human being coming through the door. And without, those, without understanding that human being coming through the door, we're kind of out of business um, because we need the public using our resources and we need the, for the public to receive us as that um, engine of support, that engine of um, financial stability, that engine of economic growth, that engine of, of crea helping create the better you so that you become um, an important participant in the life of this city. So if the curriculum needs to change dramatically. And so my library degree, I finished my library degree in 2004, so I was long into library administration before I received my degree. And so I went through the degree process, and it was nice. I now have an MLS, but I can tell you it had absolutely nothing to do with my administration of any library system that I've been involved with. So um, we have to get down to some basic understanding of what it takes to be a, 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 an employee in a, in, a, in a library system in a city this big with an, a literacy crisis. Half a million people in this city are functionally illiterate, don't have a comprehension level above the eighth grade. That's a crisis. That's a crisis. And from a small community perspective, I agree 100% with everything we've heard, heard so far, but one of our most important and impactful roles are we are community educators. So it's important for us at the community library level to be open and willing to bringing other ex uh, expertise, other professionals onto our teams be it marketing or human resources or whatever it might be, teachers, teachers, educators, in order for us to successfully be strong, substantial community educators, we need to be taught how to teach. Mm -hmm. So in my environment, it's critically important that we incorporate certified teachers onto our team, not only to directly provide instruction to the community and learning opportunities to the community, but to teach us how to teach, whether it's coding and robotics or sewing or whatever it might be, we need to have um, uh, thought about the learning outcomes in advance, developed the curriculum and the lesson plan, and then confidently bring that content forward to people. So it's really important for librarians and library staff to be open to the idea that in order for us to meet all of the complex needs and challenges in our community, we need to be open and willing to bringing in other perspectives and other areas of expertise onto our library platforms.
So, Derek, I just want to add one more thing. What's interesting about um, the decision, the conversation around, so what do we want to see in the curriculum in the library schools, it's interesting how much has been punted to the uh, Institute, Institute of Museum and Library Services to provide grants for us to establish sort of um, new curriculum that we're, that we're building. So the Free Library of Philadelphia is, is working with a number of libraries around the country to establish uh, a curriculum on community-based librarianship. And so this means at the hyper-local level, what is the work that we expect, not only of our library staff, but of our library assistant staff and our municipal guards and all of that sort of thing. So it's really taking the conversation and the need to really understand what it around community-based librarianship and what that means. And so working with smaller libraries, medium-sized libraries across the country to build the curriculum so this will be what um, most libraries, will, we hope, will pick up as part of the These sort are the lower of continuing education library process. grants from IMLS. Pre precisely, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to change the curriculum at schools that are conferring library degrees. And that's so we easy to do. We need to add all different <laughs> kinds of professionals to our staff that may not have an MLS. Uh, which will also generate a reaction by the MLS holding staff. As, as I know, I'm one of two PhDs in the free library system. A thousand people, there's two of us. We're rocking and, it. And I've, <laughs> <laughs> and I've gotten comments about just how useless that degree is, believe me. And you've been able to work with community organizers and members of the community to um, tell us about the kind of work that they've been doing with you. when. Oh, the Fayetteville system. Uh, um, we're not a system. Sorry. We're a library. <laughs> we're, just, we're part of a system and we're yeah. um, a standalone library within that system, serving about 10,000. Well, we're chartered to serve by New York State to serve about 10,000 people, but that doesn't even scratch the surface of the impact that we make. Um, however, now I forgot what you asked me. I'm curious to know about <laughs> your, your, your community work with members of the so community. Community, community organizers, organizers thank you. Um, several years ago, uh, back in about 2010-2011, um, we uh, became notable for being the first public library in the world to, uh, to open and launch a free and openly accessible fabrication lab from a community library platform. And at that time, we were also breaking a, a lot of new ground around thinking, how do we staff this uh, this new venture, how do we facilitate successfully access to this uh, new world and new way of thinking about what can happen on a library platform beyond consumption of information but more to the idea that the public library is a place for discovery and a place for um, social connection around things that are of a common interest in the community. So. We understood quickly that as librarians and library staff, we don't necessarily have the skills to uh, teach people how to sew or how to 3D print or to how to design something with uh, sophisticated software. But there are people in the community who do have these skills. And those are the people that we need to uh, identify, engage with, and bring onto our platform so that they can share their skills and their knowledge and their passion directly with their neighbors. So it became very important to us to do what we've always done, but to do it better and more completely. This idea of facilitating relationships out in the community, finding these people who have these skills or have these interests, creating space and support for them on the library platform to directly um, bring these uh, new experiences and this new knowledge and these new opportunities to their neighbors. Yeah. So the topic of community engagement is huge in the public library world. And I think everybody who's participating in the conference knows that public libraries are no longer just a place where you go to ask, what's the capital of Tanzania? Or what's the square root of 73 or They don't something. need us for that anymore. No. They don't need you for that. They, they come for community building. It's like a public plaza. Um, so we're moving beyond being service providers and becoming community empowerers, agents. Is that a scary road? I think it's a paradigm shift, right? In a sense, we're all service providers, but, but, but that implies us. So for, for years, public libraries were book warehouses and we bought stuff and then we checked it out to you and you brought it back and that, that circle of book life continues. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
that's a powerful component of what we do. But we have to stop thinking of ourselves exclusively as service providers, and I think think of ourselves as learning partners, mm -hmm. right? So how does learning begin? You know, what, what infuses learning with joy and excitement? It's, it begins with curiosity, right? So, and it has to even start with us. You know, if you're familiar with Sengi's work on the learning organization, I would challenge all of us to think about how many of us in our work lives, those who lead our organizations, we talk a lot about lifelong learning. We're big proponents of it for all the rest of the folks that are not librarians. How many of us acti actively practice that and build, you know, an organizational culture that not just supports it, but expects it? Mm -hmm. You know, and that starts with the ability to really spark curiosity in ourselves and therefore spark curiosity for our communities as well. Um, so I, that is a paradigm shift in terms of thinking, you know, there's kind of this fundamental building blocks of a service program for a public library working on that platform. But beyond that and beyond our functional operations, you know, we, our collections budget is $2 million a year. I, we circulate about 1.4 million items a year. So what? You know, those are numbers I can throw at you. They sound pretty good, right? <laughs> but what's the real point of that? The point is, what impact have we made on literacy and learning in our community? Right, precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, do, I, I think it's, that's critical. Um, and one of the things, you know, one of my, my sort of favorite but unfortunate story uh, around realizing how accessible the Free Library of Philadelphia is or was not at the time. I'm hoping we have improved it since um, some of the work that we've done. But we, we received a private grant from the Knight Foundation back in, I wanna say, 2012 um, to create what we refer to as hotspots around the city. And the hotspots where we received funding to put in digital technology training labs uh, and we brought the professional expertise to do the training and um, sort of do build that bridge on the uh, of the of the digital uh, the digital divide, and we put these hotspots in um, community-based organizations, usually oh, always in lower income, high illiteracy um, parts of the city. And what was so staggering about um, and the young the young cadre of staff that we brought in to do this were just so fabulous. Um, and that was when we sort of, to Sue's point, that we really had to change the kind of complement of staff that we had. It wasn't just librarians and clerks. It had to be an array of people with different skills to reach the different populations. So what we learned from that hotspot uh, interaction was that almost to a constituent in that space had never crossed the transom of a free library of Philadelphia building. Why? Because they presumed they had to be literate in order to use us. And that has everything to do, when you think about a lot of our structures, a lot of the old Carnegie buildings with the large, the big set of stairs and the big pillars and the, you walk in and there's this big old desk with people staring at you as soon as you walk in. You know, it's super intimidating. It's so like somebody, a temple of culture and it's not your culture. Precisely, precisely. So, um, so, that, so that just spoke volumes about how it is our work, our, not only our work, but our buildings, and how it is we presented ourselves. Um, get out from behind the dag desk because you waiting for people to come into the library asking you a reference question, those days are over and have been over for years. And so our work really had to be about changing the physical environment and to um, really draw in the customers or the constituents to understand what is it they need so that their literacy skills could improve. Now, let's be honest. If you are a low lit individual, you're not gonna be honest about your literacy skill set. So we still are working in that process um, of understanding how it is we're gonna get to those adults so that they can sort of feel safe in our world and we can, we can move them onto wraparound services where they can begin um, getting, um, getting at their their literacy education uh, in, a, in a kind of informal setting in the Free Library of Philadelphia and the kind of resources that we have to do that. The reason this is critical is because of all the children that are not reading on a fourth grade level, on a third grade level by the time they get to fourth grade. So, or the time they get, what's, I'm saying this. It's by the time they get read to fourth, by fourth grade. Yeah. So reading, on fourth gra reading at fourth grade level by the time they get to fourth grade. And only 39% of the city's children are reading on grade level by the time they get to fourth grade. So, so lots of work, but you have to begin with the moms and the dads and the caregivers to ensure that their literacy skills 
skill sets and their comfort around their ability to teach the little ones and be part of that process is, is critical here. So again, it's that outreach deep into the neighborhood that's going to, going to be important. I'm not going to press you about your community organizers in a minute, but go ahead, Gina. So let's talk about when literacy begins. It be well, it actually begins in the womb. <laughs> um, uh, but we don't really have any, you know, solid uh, research on that yet. However, it does start at birth. And so I'm going to throw something at you out here. Fifty percent of parents of young children across all un income and educational levels do not read to their children regularly. And the younger that child is, the greater the decrease. So um, we run, um, we are looking for scalability now uh, in terms of, because the service models that we've used for a hundred years mm -hmm. at least, uh, are not going to reach a significant portion of the population that needs us the most. So one program that we looked at and ended up fundraising for for three years was Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a book giveaway program started by, as you might expect, Dolly Parton. Uh, uh, no way. <laughs> who, <laughs> yeah. she and she attributed education and literacy to lifting her and her, her family out of poverty, extreme poverty. Um, so the... Um, in any given year, there are 12,500 children between the ages of birth and five in my community. Um, we already know, so kindergarten readiness, every child ready for kindergarten is what one, one of what we call our community impact goals. Um, that's a goal that will never be done, right? But you have to come up with ways of addressing these large scale issues. So, so first we know 50% of parents generally aren't reading to their young children. Then we also know that in my community, in the Topeka School District, which is our largest urban school district, 60% of children enter kindergarten not ready. And by not ready, I don't just mean they haven't had the experiences in terms of parents or a loving adult reading to them, singing to them, talking to them. Um, they may not be potty trained yet. So, so that's what we're dealing with. 80% of the children in the Topeka School District qualify for free and reduced lunch. 40% of them don't live in the same household all year long. And so when, when we're talking about illiteracy and functional illiteracy, that's actually where that starts. But what I'm still struggling with is for all of those parents that have the income, that have the education, and they're still not reading to their kids, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> We all know what it's like to get home after a busy day of work and, uh, you know, I have a seven-year-old. It's mm -hmm. so easy to just park him in front of the TV and go off and do something else, but you can't do that. Raising a child is not about dropping them off at school and picking them up at school. Right. And uh, obviously we rely on libraries to be big partners for us in that. Well, effort. yeah, but there's also, um, I remember when our children were little, Jim was the, my husband was the one that read to them before they went to bed at night, and it was this whole big cuddle thing, and he, they, would, they would just, you know, sit in the, in the hook of his arm, and that was heaven to them. And, and their favorite book was Hop on Pop, so of course it ended up being a messy situation. <laughs> <before>. <laughs> my, my son loves that one, too, and, and he loves Beatrix Potter, which mm -hmm. comes from me. I read him Beatrix Potter because I love those books. I've never grown out of those. Right. Mm -hmm. And he said to me a couple months ago, it was like a dagger through my heart. He said, Daddy, I hate old books. And, you know, <laughs> and I, I'm an old book guy. <laughs> you <laughs> are I, in I said, trouble, Why, man. Why, <laughs> William? And he said, because they're all black and white. And I said, but that's not true. I could show you books that are 500 years old that are full, full of color. And mm -hmm. really? So a lot of eyes to be opened. Mm -hmm. Even the ones that we think should be. <laughs> I feel so sorry for that little guy. <laughs> he's, he's got some weird ideas about libraries all around. We, we walk into the lobby of the, of the Central Library. The, the Parkway Central Library is the main library of the free library system. And he will say to me, Daddy, shh, we're in a library. Mm. And it's this, you know, 1950s curious George informed vision of uh, children and monkeys in libraries getting yelled at and librarians raising rulers. Well, they still have librarians with buns and hush puppies. Take a look at the three of us. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I told you they were from outer space. <laughs> Just a quick comment. Please. It's from a community library perspective, same issues, different scope. What we try to do is um, do a lot of targeted strategic outreach um, by connecting with doctor's offices, pediatrician's offices, um, local hospitals, et cetera, where we not only mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
leave information there about how the library can support you and your literary literacy efforts with your child. But for those people who um, would feel like, um, and they do, that this isn't for me, or I don't have the skill sets to be able to even participate in this learning and training, what we do try to do is we embed librarians in the hospitals and in the doctor's offices on days agreed upon that, okay, um, if there's some sort of a, a fair or nursery fair or um, kindergarten fair or preschool fair and those types of things going on, that, You're we're, represented. that we're there and we're represented and, and we're actually having conversations with um, uh, potential uh, uh, participants in these <coughs> learning programs at the library. And it's not just for parents, it's for grandparents parents and uh, any kind of guardian that you might be with a young one who you can assist with just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of confidence that you can impact their uh, literacy growth. Um, it, it, it's fascinating how many people feel like, oh, geez, I, I may even be aware that this opportunity exists to gain these skills at my library, but it's not for me. I, I, I don't come from a place or a place of confidence or a place where I believe that this is something for me. Mm -hmm. So we really need to be where they are to have these exactly. conversations exactly. to get them to come right. in. So we use librarying as a verb, right? Mm -hmm. So and and that's exactly right. I mean, we don't have branches. We're spread out over 550 square miles. So what do you do about service equity, right? That's a huge issue because the person who lives 26 miles away is paying the same tax rate as a person who lives two blocks away. Um, but it's really about that. And your library is supported by a millage tax, is that it correct? It is, actually, and we are a library district, so my board controls the tax rate, uh, which is a great place to be, because oh, one of the things man, we want to talk about is <laughs> sustainability. All my colleagues are jealous. <laughs> are. I know I am. <laughs> when you control the money, you control your present, and you control your future, right? But, but this librarying um, goes on now as much out in the community as it does in our buildings. And, and that's becoming more and more of a trend, you know, uh, that um, there's a couple things that I think really guide the, all of our work now. And that one is that at any given moment, we may have as many staff outside the building as we do inside. And the second is that we do nothing as a Lone Ranger anymore. Everything is done in, in partnership. And that raises a whole other set of issues. Partnership is wonderful. Collaboration is wonderful. You can leverage your resources. You can expand your, your, your scope and your reach. And partners can be a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure they feel the same way about us because when you're talking about real collaboration, you're talking about mixing your staff. You're talking about mixing other resources like money. You're talking about policies banging up against each other and maybe even core values. And all of that has to be negotiated and managed. And as those partnerships evolved, that so at this point, we have one of our director level managers is assigned to managing partnerships and monitoring all of our MOUs, our memorandums of understanding, because that's, we feel at this point that partnerships really need to be more formal than informal. Mm -hmm. So it's spelled out exactly what each of us brings to the party, as it were, and what we're committed to and what we will deliver as our part of it. Mr. Juan, maybe a quick word from you about the complexity of the Read by Fourth collaboration, Free Library as facilitator. So um, hopefully many of you have heard about the Read by Fourth campaign. Um, and it, so it, it's two parts. It's a campaign to bring together right now it's up to 130 partners. And though that partnership, that's a collective impact program. And each of the partners contributes to ensuring in the, within the work of that typically nonprofit, uh, the work they're going to do to ensure that the children are reading on grade level by the time they get to fourth grade. So we are both the backbone of this. The Free Library of Philadelphia uh, is the backbone of the campaign, but we're also a partner. And so what we do as part of the partnership is, is all of this work around um, community engagement. And this is the important work of our community organizers. Um, because this is the other thing, once you get outside the building, our librarians typically are not comfortable in the community engagement, in, in that, in, a, in the community organizing piece of it. It's a, it's a really different bit of work about how it is you reach deep into communities and, and to whom it is you're talking to and how it is you're speaking to them and what it is that relationship needs to be. And so, um, so our work really is at the hyper-local level 
um, working with the barbershops and the beauty salons and the bodegas and finding the constituencies in those neighborhoods to ensure that we're engaging that mom or pop or caregiver to come into the library so that they can get an introduction, but bring that little person with you so that we can help you read to that child or at least engage you at a very uh, visceral level on your relationship with the library. So. These community organizers are a really special group of people. Um, they have more energy than anybody. It's fabulous what they're doing. And so that helps you address issues of diversity and inclusion as well. Sure does. Because I keep coming back to, I've been in this profession for 40 years because I'm really old. <laughs> and um, and the, the, the statistics haven't changed. We're still 80% white and female. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We have all kinds of initiatives and all kinds of studies mm -hmm. and all kinds of programs, um, but we haven't really moved the needle. And, and so I think that for the single biggest priority in any, making any of these things successful is building trust, right? Mm -hmm. So your community organizers have that. Oh yeah. They have those community They're from the community, that's right. Yeah. And, and so um, sending out a librarian who is not from that neighborhood who may have never been in that neighborhood, you know, never drives Doesn't in that area, in that right yes, um, is not gonna be successful. And inside the library, you've also been able to improve the diversity of your staff by making many positions MLS preferred instead of MLS required, is that right? Yes, I, I didn't hear any horrified gas, so I assume you're okay with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'll warn you, this is a union town. There may be <laughs> yeah. an inflatable rat outside. When well, we and, and, and we're, not, we're, not, we're not alone in that. And we're not constrained by union rules. We're not a union shop, and so that, that has made it easier for us to do. But, but, and don't get me wrong, I'm proud of my MLS. I've been proud of it for all 40 years. Um, but what we're finding is, is that we can cast a wider net um, if we make the require, it, make it not a required but a preferred criteria. Um, and we get some amazing applicants that way. Uh, and my feeling is, and this dates back to the time uh, I was a circulation manager, because I've managed just about every department of a library. Um, and uh, what I always said about circulation was, is I hire mainly people who've worked retail. I worked retail too, because if you can tell me after that experience that you still like people, <coughs> I want you, because I can, I can teach you the library stuff, yeah. but I cannot teach you to like people. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, I have children's librarians that don't like children. <laughs> really bad thing, really bad thing. We've all been there. <laughs> so I wanna ask one more big question, and then we're gonna open up questions to the audience. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and make one big change that would lead to a sea change in libraries over the next 10, 20 years, what would that change be? Well, you know what I think. It's changing the funding and governance model. You know, my feeling is, so we know something about public libraries. I was a city librarian in Ames, Iowa for 10 years. Wonderful experience. I was always looking for money. So it, it just meant that we had the great ideas. We knew what we needed to do. We were ready to go, but we just needed more resources. And you had to stop and get those somehow. So money never got to be the excuse, but it wasn't just handed to you, right? And, and a lot of us are in the same position. For public libraries, there are other options. There's something called the library district, and we're kind of spread throughout the country. Um, we're not part of city or county government or local government. We are our own municipalities in effect, so that my board actually has taxing authority. Um, and if you look across the country at the per capita support, um, and, and not necessarily the quality of services because what Free Library does with its budget and with, with Siobhan's leadership is amazing. You know, because she does not let that stop her. She does not let her, her budget challenges stop her. But imagine what she could do if her board controlled her finances. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and so, so, so my feeling is, is time passes either way. I figure it takes at least 10 years to get a library district established because you have to jump through a lot of hoops. You have to make sure your state has enabling legislation to do that. You're gonna fight local, the local electeds who don't like turning loose of control even if they don't wanna give you the money. Um, and, and so, but again, time passes either way. 
So what's the end game here? If we want, I refuse to use the word relevance anymore in terms of seeking relevance. That's a defensive posture. You know, we need to go in saying we're leaders in the community, we're change agents in the community, we can have enormous positive influence if we have the resources we need to get it done. And if we have total control over our policies and our, and our, uh, and our operations. And the one way to do that is a different funding and governance model. Mm -hmm. so. Ditto. Everything Gina said is exactly <laughs> what I feel. Does that funding model apply to your library district as well? I, I, keep, I keep using the wrong terms and words when I refer to yeah. the Fayetteville Free Library. The district idea would be Nirvana. No, mm -hmm. we're not in that situation. We're a free association library. So, which are the hardest to fund? It, which right. are the hardest to right. fund? Our aspirations consistently exceed our budget. Right. So, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of a distraction from our, mm -hmm. you know, reaching our goals and uh, being able to think big and be innovative and take some risks, and uh, that's a real barrier for a for free association library. So the district model certainly is, um, I think, the way that we should be um, uh, encouraging all of our advocates to be having those conversations with the decision makers uh, to consider that special districting or districting type of model. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to come at it. Yes, to the funding part of it. I'll never, mm -hmm. I'll never deny the fact that what keeps me awake at night is uh, the funding we have or don't have in order to run a 21st century library system. But I, you know, I have, I often say that our work could occur any place, and so we're bound by the buildings that we have. Um, and I often believe that we could do our work almost anywhere, particularly as it relates to the civic engagement and the and the cultural enrichment part of that conversation building and awareness and. And, and taking advantage of, as uh, Gina said, the partnerships and our work can occur literally anywhere. And so that, for me, is a push that um, if, in fact, the budget gets tighter, let's see who else we're in relationship with. We can use their facilities, mm -hmm. and our librarians can sort of like have a bunch of cowboys and cowgirls that go out and whip it up and all over the neighborhoods. And so, yeah, I think our-, our Develop other co-location agreements. We yeah. have one neighborhood yeah. library that's yeah. located in a building that was built by a regional hospital, mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. also a right. city, city health center in the same We're building. We're very defined by our, f by, our, by our physical assets, yes. and, um, and sometimes those assets are, are not assets, and so. Um, and they're always expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, they're old. They're, all, they're yeah. all on average 70 to 100 year old buildings. Yeah. All 55 of them. <laughs> Needy. Way too many. <laughs> but rather than pass the hat now, we're going to pass the microphones and see what questions you all have. Robert, I saw your hand go up first, way in the back. Now wait, wait for the wait for the microphone, please. Need it for the live stream. Robert Miller with Lyricis. Uh, first of all, I just want to make a comment and, and thank the three of you and all the other public librarians that exist. The breadth of responsibilities that you all have when Derek went through it truly is amazing, makes my job look tame in comparison. My question is uh, pretty simple. Uh, where do the three of you find that you have to lead from the back, lead from the middle, or lead from the front? And where do you think you really should be leading? So I'll start, I'm, I'm currently leading from the front. Um, and I don't, I, and I think after 10 years, I'd like to sort of step to the rear. Um, uh, it, only because the, the system needed a lot of sort of come on, you know, let's, let's get going, let's whip it up. Um, I think that we have uh, a cadre of new uh, leadership coming along that we've spent a lot of time, energy, and effort cultivating. So I'm perfectly happy to switch to the back and, and, and do the push from the back. But push nonetheless. I'm either pushing or pulling. It's, it's either way. And um, I'm comfortable not being the sort of let's get out there stuff, you know. I think it's important for, for the visionary piece of it to start coming up from the, the newer, particularly the new librarians that we're bringing in who are really creative, wonderful people. So Regina, you want to add anything to that? I, I see myself as leading from, I guess, the middle of the pack now. Um, uh, we've worked very hard on changing the culture of the organization to a more distributed shared power and decision-making model. Um, there's still a reason to have a CEO, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do what we do. Mayor has to call and yell at somebody. <laughs> mm, that's, that's right. We're, the, we're that last line of defense. Yes. You know, um, and, and in some ways, we, we will always be the, the, an important public face for our institution, but we're not the only one anymore. You know, it used to be that the public library director was the only one out in the community. 
that's not true anymore. Um, you know, we have librarians and library staff sitting at many community tables, and they are authorized to be there. So, you know, we have this little uh, um, code word we use to, uh, to to really assess what we're being asked to do in in the community. And actually, this came from our youth services supervisor. She came back from a meeting, and it was an early childhood meeting. Uh, and uh, I said, "Okay, Leanne, what happened?" She said, and she just looked at me and she said, "Brochure." And that's our code word for, yeah, it's just another group that wants to get together and put their put some information out and put our names on our brochure. We're not interested in doing that anymore, right? We want true collaboration where everybody's all in and everybody is interested in collective impact. And so to be able to do that, you can't centralize power at the top of the organization. You've got to give, because I'm not going to send librarians out and all they're going to do is say, well, I can do a bookmark. You know, no, this is about here's the resources and the skills and talents the library can bring to bear on this particular community issue, and I'm here to actually offer that. I'm authorized to offer that. Yeah, shared leadership all the way. I, I often think of um, my most current organization, my role in that was very much a facilitative role. I'm a resource, I'm a facilitator, I clear paths where I can, make resources available so that all of those talented people can carry the ball forward. So if you think about an emergency room, someone's got to be there um, uh, triage and kind of overseeing in a general way and making space for when the different uh, areas of expertise have to step in and, and do their critical work. So I, I feel very much um, committed to the idea of sharing leadership across the organization and um, the leadership of that organization uh, should be in a very facilitative role. Hi, Ellen Dunlap. I want to not lose the opportunity to ask you all about the role of rare book collections within today's public libraries. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's the greatest um, opportunity for us to reach audiences which are um, more research oriented. I mean, we have these amazing collections at the Free Library of Philadelphia and in collaboration with uh, Rosenbach. Um, it's building the expertise around curatorial, the curatorial expertise which has been occurring over uh, the last 10 years. Um, we've um, now have an exhibitions program which I think is important but it's, it's, it's I don't want the rare book to collection to be a really quiet space that nobody goes to. I want it activated, exposed, let people come through and have my curators have be a much more ubiquitous um, presence throughout library programming so that is, as we relate day to day work, there's material that from, you know, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, that this is not new. This has been, this is recycled through history and let's see what it looked like a thousand years ago, right? I have to take a crack at Ellen's question as well since that's my role at the <laughs> Free Library and the Rosenbach. There is currently no sign in the Parkway Central Library that gives directions to the rare book department. And that's because for decades, people who wanted to use that department knew where it was. Mm -hmm. They knew what to do. And as our panelists this morning pointed out, we need to do a lot more to make collections accessible. And my staff now works hand in hand with the Center for Public Engagement, the educational and programming staff. We are committed to activating our collections or we're not going to keep them. If we can't put something in someone's hands that may be literally, maybe figuratively, that may be digitally, and explain to them why it's relevant to something they care about today, we might as well not have it. So we're really working hard to bring our collections through exhibitions and other programs to new audiences at the Central Library. The scary part, the thing that keeps me up at night, is we're also committed to bringing special collections into the neighborhood libraries where they've never been. And yet we have diverse neighborhoods throughout Philadelphia where our very diverse special collections would be of great interest. So time's a waste. And I think we don't we don't want to denigrate our print collections. I mean, I, you know, public libraries have done themselves no favors by you know creating taglines like "Public libraries were more than books." Mm -hmm. Well, what does that even mean? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> you define yourself by what you're you're not. I, so, but we have an enormous investment in print, um, and print is still kind of the coin of the realm. It's kind of our meat and potatoes. Um, that's shifting every year with 
the circulation of digital content, ebooks, those sorts of things. So one of the things that we're looking at is increasing accessibility, which just means making them more available. We already have some programs in place like Library at Work, where we have agreements with a number of our employers in our community. They put a link to our catalog on their staff website. Um, we go out and do library card sign up. They have time to search our catalog and we do daily or weekly deliveries to the work sites. So that allows people that ordinary, so they can get books for themselves. It can be for professional use, personal use, for their kids' homework, you know, whatever, whatever they need. But more and more, I'm beginning to realize our buildings, there's always limitations because of the hours we're not open. And so there's now some new uh, um, products that, that a number of us are looking at that will allow us to open our buildings without staffing, um, and at least for certain parts. And so I think strategies like that are what we need to do to really serve readers better, um, entice people that maybe don't think of themselves as readers. Um, but I think we the focus has to be on the reader. I also, so when we go back to your question, it was really interesting. A, um, a number of years ago when I first got to the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, my concern initially uh, uh, right out uh, in, front, in front was the, ca the care we did not give that collection, those collections. It was really pretty abysmal. And so, uh, and, and poor Janine Pollock, who was, is, was, is the head of the Rare Book Collection, I, I probably gave her 27 heart attacks during that period of time because I, I was so concerned. Like, what kind of stewards are we? These are the conditions that we're gonna have these collections. We can't even bring the public up, really, because the housing was so poor. So I'm proud to say that um, literally Janine's persistence that we you know, really focus on this. Um, we did put millions of dollars into restoring the third floor and adding um, the right type of um, temperature and HVAC controls, the, the preservation housing, and really adding a lot of support into, into that collection. So now it's a far more accessible collection. So the tough piece now is that you know our collection, particularly at the Free Library of Philadelphia, it was gifts from many people, so it's pretty kind of like, well, kind of all over the place and so um, so I really kind of hoping that over with Derek's leadership and Janine's leadership that we're now going to be able to sort of focus and create the mission of what we're going to keep and how we're going to keep it and that kind of thing so yeah mm -hmm. and we have a question waiting out here in the audience yes um, great session could you um, talk a bit about any formal programs you may have with k-12 or higher education and how you might see that changing going forward or what you might like to see happen in cooperation with the education in your area? Do you want to start? Uh, well, a, a lot of us um, are, have library card campaigns going on where the goal being that every child in K through 12 has a library card um, and then developing wraparound services for faculty and parents so that it's one thing to have a card, it's quite another thing to use it. Um, and, and so that, that's certainly a component of that. And that's, that's been an initiative now for maybe about five years. Mm -hmm. Nashville, Tennessee kind of started it with their Limitless Libraries program. Um, I think that we have a local university, Washburn University, which is a four-year uh, liberal arts college with a, with a law school. And you know, we're the capital city, so you can't spit without hitting the lawyer. Um, <laughs> So we have a, we have a lot here. No, that, that's a good thing, I think. Um, but um, the uh, the actual dean of of the library is actually a pr uh, professor of history, Ellen Bierman, who's an amazing library leader. Um, and so we've begun because they're serving primarily undergrads, who we also serve anyway. Um, it's it's been really interesting to begin to talk about. Okay, so how do we help facilitate and plug into their writing center? Um, you know, how what what can we add, or, or how can we enhance so that we're not duplicating collection development and those sorts of things? But I've been really intrigued by what I'm hearing here because a lot of the big research libraries. I really think that there might there's some opportunities to partner with your local public libraries to get that expanded access that you might be looking for because we've got the people and you've got the stuff. 
to put it very simply. Sue, <laughs> so how about Fayetteville's work with yeah, education? Yeah, in our area, particularly in our district, um, academic excellence, particularly in the area of um, STEM and STEAM learning is a very high priority. Um, it's, it's a community value that this particular um, community holds very highly. So recognizing this and always wanting to do our best to not be redundant in services, we don't want to duplicate what the school district is doing, but to uh, better leverage our community resources, including the library spaces, technology, and expertise to give students and their parents and their families an opportunity to have uh, rich, meaningful um, learning opportunities available after school hours around those STEM areas, STEM, coding, computer science. So we do everything from teaching district teachers how to teach Python, for instance, to um, bringing in um, parents and their toddlers um, to uh, uh, begin to learn the language of and the, and the beginning um, skills that you need um, in the area of robotics. So we try to uh, get our finger directly on the pulse of what's valuable and important in our community today at this moment and then use our spaces and our resources and our people to support um, that work. So for the Free Library, I have to say, um, given our strategic plan, our hyper-focus has been zero through, um, let's say, the fourth grade, and that has a lot to do with our Read by Fourth program, the relation that is uh, integrated with the school district and the archdiocesan schools and the charter schools. And so that's a pretty well-connected program, and the relationship between our children's librarians, hopefully there's one in every branch, but there isn't, I can tell you, um, and, and the school district, um, or the school, the local school, and making sure that there's a relationship and a sort of information sharing session that's constantly going on. It's better in some neighborhood libraries than others. Mm -hmm. We're less good uh, when it comes to our, you know, sort of, um, sort of eighth grade through 12. Um, it's a practice that we're building, and we'll have our first serious teen library open up in March at the Parkway Central Library. Um, you know, and a lot of that, I'll say, has to do with we don't have teen services as a specific specialty within the Free Library of Philadelphia. So it's children's services and then it's adult teen services. And so, you know, and I, and I personally don't like that combination because what you've done is that your teen is not a child nor an adult. It is actually is a very specific um, age um, that, needs, that needs unique types of services and attention. So we do programming around it, and I have librarians that are super focused on the success of teens in their neighborhoods and do a lot of programming around it. And particularly, um, uh, they're very sensitive on the, the social issues now. It's be, um, you know, our, our, some of our libraries where our, you know, we're bringing in a lot of social um, leaders, uh, civic leaders to come and talk to these, whether it's the police or whether it's uh, the Urban League or any number. These young people have a lot to say. They're concerned about the conditions and the politics in this country, what they can say, what they can't say, and how well they can say it. And so. You know, um, I think we're really good on the, you know, the K through five, you know, zero through five, fifth grade, and then beyond fifth grade, we're less good. And so that's a practice that we have to build on. I can tell you, we're, we're starting to get into that in special collections. Mm -hmm. We're bringing high school students in to work on National History Day projects. They have a requirement from school to work with primary materials, and we have them in spades. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a great, it's little, but it's a great partnership. Got to start someplace. I think we maybe have time for another question or two. Um, Hi. Please. I'm on the uh, board of uh, Association Library. I'm also a certified teacher, and I'm retired. And I believe in absolutely everything you said about community outreach and all the types of uh, things that libraries can offer to the communities. In fact, I teach the sewing program at my library. Um, but I would like to say that as a patron, as a general public patron of a public library, that experience has changed completely. Um, there, are, there are now floating collections, which definitely advantage communities in which, you know, certain libraries may have more advantages in terms of education. The materials tend to float there and stay there. Um, there are changes in buying. There are changes in other circulation policies that have resulted in fewer books on the shelves for browsing. Um, and in that, I see a divide, a technical divide, 
they, we've talked about people with low income who may not have resources, but there are also um, older patrons who've paid taxes for many, many years to you know, beef up those public libraries, and they will be the people out in the street screaming and carrying on if you're threatened. Um, I've been told that this is the wave of the future, that patrons will need to know exactly what book they need. They'll need to order it from home. There is no browsing. Give it up. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Wow, there goes serendipity, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I would say, actually, we've, I, I've hired more catalogers in the last 10 years instead of, uh, and, and it's because of the way we reorganized our collections into what we call neighborhoods. So we've messed with Dewey a little bit. Because, I mean, let's be honest, Dewey is, I mean, there are, you know, um, the same topic is in disparate areas, which makes no sense to regular people. Um, our goal now is, is, is to increase browsability. Because when you present a human being with, say, more than 5,000 items, they check out, right? And so browsing is essential in a public library. So I would say those of us, I think we're very committed to this idea that one of the best ways to serve readers is to really um, make sure that we're facilitating their access to the physical book and that that's a really positive experience for them. We have a service called Red Carpet that is specifically targeted at older adults. And the books in those collections are organized differently. A lot more large print, a lot more face out, you know, those, those sorts of things. Just more visual merchandising overall. Um, but my goal, you know, lowest common denominator, if someone walks in my library, they've just gotten a diagnosis, they have a, a diabetes, right? And they've just gotten the diagnosis, it's like, what am I gonna do? Okay, they can walk in my library, they may not talk to a librarian, they may not use the catalog, they can walk to the shelf and find something they need. Mm -hmm. And that should be the goal, I think, for any library. What's so fascinating about that comment is that um, there, uh, um, our data now coming out that um, the millennial population actually prefers the tactile book. And um, it is a big resurgence in the publishing industry now because of that recognition that this new, this whole generation is almost reverting back, if you will, if, if, if it is a revert back, but it's just a preference for the tactile material. So. Um, I'm, um, I'm just stunned by what it is you said because that's not our reality. It's not going to be our reality. Um, and this whole concept of the neighborhoods, the, these collection neighborhoods, is really taking hold and it's a much more preferential way because our Dewey classification makes absolutely no sense to anybody coming through the door, none, zero. Just yeah, a please quick comment. No, no, add something, and then we have time for one more question upstairs. You bet. Making the shift to this kind of hybrid browsability type of classification system, I know in our library when we made that shift about oh, maybe 10 years ago now, um, the response from the community was, oh, you've purchased so much more. <laughs> There's so much more available. It was all already there. They just couldn't find it. You know, it wasn't intuitive. It wasn't browsable. So yeah, that was a game changer for us when we made that shift. Remember what Raghunathan said, save the time of the reader. Mm -hmm. yeah. That okay. dude knew what he was talking about. <laughs> we have a question upstairs, and then I think we owe you all a coffee break, so please. Thank you. I will try to keep this very uh, very short because of the special dispensation. I'm a newly minted library director in a town of 25,000 um, in a membership library. There is also a, lar a large-ish um, public library. Um, um, I think it was, I think it was Gina who brought up partnerships and community partnerships. And one of my interests is making um, a connection with our public library and looking for ways to partner. So I'm wondering if you could speak very quickly about um, partners successful partnerships and what you look for, since you said some partnerships can be perhaps more trouble than they're worth. Um, what is an ideal partner for you, just in general? Shared goal. Commitment to not just outputs, but outcomes. Um, committed to collective impact. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Very clearly defined roles help as well. What they said, I, I couldn't, the shared goal piece of it is is critical. Um, and that, because you know, you don't want to be going off like this because then you're going to be spending more energy just trying to drag that person back to at least the middle. Um, so from the outset, you have to, that, that has to be established. 
just been advised we have time for one more question at the back. Oh. So let's take that. So you spoke about the need for to venture away from staff who simply love books um, and that there are necessary changes for the MLIS curricula, as well as the compressed salaries that we see in the profession and the need to grow diversity in the same. How do we increase the agency exposure, interest, and growth prior to graduate school? And since you're in community libraries, I was curious about how you're doing that in your own libraries. In other words, exposing younger people to the profession who might not think that libraries are where they want to spend their time, mm -hmm. uh, that they don't want to be that librarian that you were mentioning, sir, that your son thinks is just, oh, we have to shush and be quiet. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what's going on at the K through 12 level in these community libraries. Thank you. So I'll, um, we have a pro ap an after school program um, where we have uh, what are called um, after school leaders. Um, and these are usually teenagers in the sophomore, junior, senior years of high school who are responsible for this, um, what we call our LEAP program, LEAP um, library education after school program. And the whole idea is that these uh, young people are mentors to the younger people that are coming in. So working with the, you know, helping them get their homework done, act as tutors if in fact there's a challenge to their reading or they need a little bit more math support. Those teenagers are then supported by what's called an after school leader who is an adult typically in the community and manages the program on behalf of the, that local library. I cannot tell you how many young people, uh, so here's the piece of data. So of these teens, and we have 100 of them on, on an annual basis, there's usually two per library, 85% um, of them um, graduate from high school, which is a very big deal in Philadelphia that 85% of these young people graduate from high school in the four year period of time. And then, and then that 85% of that 85% go on to college. It's a, also a very big deal. Now, many of those young people end up coming back to the library to seek employment or go to library school. I don't know the number, but I cannot, you have, it's really quite impressive how many of those young people enjoy that library experience and want to become um, a library. So it's, the other part of it is just even hiring uh, staff in our library assistant titles, how many of them love the work and will go to library school from that, from that, from that, um, from that uh, classification as well. So we've done some of the things, not on the scale that you've done, certainly. Um, it's interesting though, I serve on the board of a, a it's actually an LLC uh, called 712 Innovations. Um, which is a hybrid co-work maker space. So it's, it's evolving into kind of an incubator for entrepreneurial startups. And, and the, the director of that, um, who was just recently hired, is from Germany. And I've been having some interesting conversations with her about apprenticeship, um, and, which is, is very common. Uh, that, that system of apprenticeships is very common in Germany, not so common in the United States at all. And I'm, so I've had one or two conversations about might the library be a test bed, you know, for actually beginning some sort of apprenticeship program that could start well before high school is over? Um, so those are just ideas at this point. Nothing's, nothing's been, but I think we have to do more so that we don't become that second career. Okay, I washed out of my first one, so I, I guess I can do libraries because that looks not stressful, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, yeah. and, uh, you know, or, when they begin to connect the joy they have in coming to the library with the fact that then if you're working there, you get to, to facilitate that joy. I would say um, <clears throat> there are two different ways that we, um, that we pursue, pursue this. Uh, on the smaller scale with our tween and teen community, we do have a librarian in training program. And this attracts kids who are confident and interested in certain areas like coding or writing or whatever it might be, um, making um, widgets, whatever it might be, that they're interested in sharing what they know with their peers. And through uh, marketing of programs, et cetera, uh, and 
these teams also in tweens taking the responsibility to bring the opportunity for their peers to come to the library to gain this knowledge or to have these experiences, uh, peer-led experiences. Um, we have a, a, a great result from that. It doesn't necessarily, I don't think, lead to people suddenly having an epiphany and saying, I want to be a librarian. But what it does do, it makes kids think differently about the library. And that's kind of an inroad, possibly, to, to, to that type of result. And the other thing that we do at our community library, Syracuse University is a close um, neighbor and partner of ours. And all of our frontline staff are students from Syracuse University, but they're not just students in the Masters of Information Science uh, program. They're students in the School of Education, in the School of Design, and uh, a, a diverse uh, uh, array of uh, programs. And they come and they contribute in a real meaningful way in an incubator type way to the learning of not only our staff and our team, but to the community at large, because they're able to bring really great program ideas that we may never consider and um, also have the opportunity to develop and execute these programs. So um, I think we're making a, a, a nice impact in our little corner of the world, particularly through this relationship with Syracuse University. So there's a library in Sweden, don't ask me the town, um, that has a title called Cool Hunters. And the idea is that they hire young people from the community to go out and fan out in the community and bring back to the library the things that they're finding cool and have the library implement that, to implement that work. Aarhus, is it Doc One? It's before Doc One, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And something all of us in special collections can try, this goes back to the morning panels again, open your collections to high school students. Mm -hmm. So easy to do. Please join me in thanking once again our three panelists. <laughs>